Okay, judging by the end of the last review, you might have guessed that I'm not really looking forward to this. To clarify, I actually do like The Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog as a television show, despite how goofy and inane it is. But what I don't like is seeing another medium just taking ideas and plot threads from the show and trying to repurpose it for that medium. It's not even an adaptation, as we'll see when we go and look at the issue proper, more just taking the premise of an episode, and elements from it, and transforming it into something that would be a cheap knockoff of said episode. As is shown from the cover of the book, the episode in question is Pseudo-Sonic, probably one of the first instances of an evil robotic doppelganger for our hero, predated, I think, only by Silver Sonic in Sonic 2. Trust me, this comic, and the Sonic franchise as a whole, really likes its evil robot doppelgangers. The cover itself is kind of confusing, actually, as we see both Sonic and Pseudo dashing towards Sally, who's about to be crushed by a cartoonish safe. The way the cover is set up, it looks like both Sonics are competing to see who can save her first, though it looks like Pseudo-Sonic is doing it for more selfish reasons. I'd also like to point out that the cover claims that we are about to witness a saga, which makes me think that at this point the writers at Archie didn't really know what the word saga meant. We open to part one of our first story, Pseudo-Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog, I know everything about you! Dr. Robotnik, Tyrant, Polluter, and Serial Stalker. He exposits that he has used his vast knowledge and understanding of the Hedgehog to create Pseudo-Sonic, the ultimate evil robot. Pseudo-Sonic demonstrates his powers by lifting Robotnik up, bashing through a wall, and then throwing Robotnik a good distance away. Of course, there are still a few bugs to iron out. So, robots can have fleas? Who knew? Meanwhile, in the Great Forest, Sonic's hopping out of the secret entrance to Knothole. He and Antoine banter for a bit, and Sonic refuses to tell him that he's going out to pick some flowers for Princess Sally. Aww. And then we cut to Sonic picking flowers. An oddly talkative butterfly named Betty floats by, and I'm sure she'll be a very necessary and important character later on in the comic. She points out that Sonic's knowledge of botany is apparently lacking because he's standing in a giant field of poisoned sumac blossoms. Sonic immediately starts to scratch and then puffs up into a bloated, gross mess that is just... just unpleasant. Meanwhile, Antoine is just about to lock up the stump entrance when Pseudo-Sonic appears and apparently Antoine just doesn't question the fact that Sonic looks distinctly more metal and evil and not at all like Sonic. He just leads him down the secret entrance to Knothole, and we get to see exactly how easy it is to tell Sonic from Pseudo when Tails makes this face. Look at it and despair, folks. Years before the Tails doll was providing us with nightmare fuel, there was early Archie Sonic. Well, the reason he's making the face, and the reason everyone else is gasping, is because literally every other person in this room can tell that that is not Sonic. And we end part one with Pseudo-Sonic radioing Robotnik to tell him that he's sending the coordinates for Knothole. And on the opposite page, we have the start of part two, where no one is making a move to stop Pseudo as he's talking to Robotnik on his plot convenience monitor. Instead, they decide to spend their time glaring at Antoine when Pseudo points out that he was just able to follow Antoine into the hidden base. Robotnik is about to take down the coordinates when suddenly the connection between them dies. And we cut back to Knothole where Tails has actually taken the time to do something about the creature that could potentially spill the location to their most hated enemy, dragging his tails along the ground and defeating Pseudo-Sonic through the power of static electricity. My god, this robot is lame. Pseudo-Sonic breaks apart into pieces, and while the group examines the parts in the hopes of getting some answers, a disembodied narrator comes from nowhere to ask us where Sonic is. Turns out he's been slowly, very slowly, trying to make his way back to Knothole, but his energy is sapped from having to scratch himself the whole way back. He makes it back to the edge of the Great Forest, only to have Robotnik appear there as well. Robotnik has managed to triangulate the last coordinates of Pseudo-Sonic, and then we cut back to the Freedom Fighters. No doubt about it, this was manufactured by Robotnik. No! Really? Oh my god, who would have guessed? Betty Butterfly flutters in from somewhere, seriously, how the hell did she get down there to begin with, and tells everyone that Sonic's in a bad way. 
We cut back to Sonic as Robotnik takes a shot at the helpless hedgehog with a flamethrower, and I need to readjust my neck from the major case of whiplash this story is giving me. <laughs> Ugh. Seriously, this story is constantly switching back and forth from scene to scene at such a breakneck pace that it's kind of hard to get invested in one when we're already zooming towards another. Robotnik opts to crush Sonic with a giant mace ball, but before he can, his egomatic is completely blown apart by a well-placed finger beam from Bunny. And after several issues of having her absent or barely doing anything on her own, it is extremely satisfying to see her lift Robotnik up and fling him all the way back to his home base. And she even demonstrates just how broken a teammate she is by also being able to dispense some healing cream to take care of Sonic's itching problem. And we close on the Freedom Fighters dumping what's left of Pseudo-Sonic in the trash, while he all but begs the kids reading the comic to write in so that he can get a sequel. Not likely, because this story is stupid. The pacing is all over the place, the villain is worthless, the situation with Sonic incredibly contrived, and dare I say it, the cartoon did this plot a heck of a lot better. The one good thing I'll say about it is at least the Freedom Fighters were smart enough not to get fooled by an obviously false Sonic, though that kind of goes out the window when they just stand there and almost let him blow the location to Robotnik. Two pages of filler and we enter the second story, what's the point? Well, with this issue, I'm certainly asking myself that several times. Sonic zooming through the forest with some forget-me-nots for Sally's birthday, However, before he makes it very far, a rather unhealthy-looking bird falls on his head from a tree. It turns out it's a Mobian needle bird, a cross between a bird and a porcupine. Well, that's just weird. And random. Noting that its wing looks injured, Sonic decides to take it back to Knothole to keep it safe from Robotnik, only to have Sally immediately tell Sonic to get rid of it. Turns out the Freedom Fighters have had a few other problems with cute... Fuzzy, seemingly harmless animals, including a beaver that turned out to be a killer robot, a squirrel with a tracking device attached to it, and even a deer that turned out to be a bombardier. Okay, you have no real excuse for that one. However, the last straw isn't the fact that he might be a hazard to the team, or an unwilling double agent, but it's when the injured animal leaps on the table and starts to eat all of Sally's birthday cake. She immediately orders that Sonic take it out of the base. And what does the oh-so-wise and compassionate leader decide to do? Well, she grabs a basket and heads out to get more needleberries for her cake. Alright, first of all, Needleberry has to be the most unappetizing name for a berry ever. And second, Sally, didn't you learn your lesson from the whole sorceress debacle? I mean, if you go out on your own, you're likely to be captured, and of course she is. A large robotic tree that oddly reminds me of those rude apple trees from The Wizard of Oz has captured Sally while Robotnik and Snively watch from their plot convenience monitors. Sonic takes a sledgehammer to the fourth wall, stopping the story dead so that we can rattle off as many bad tree puns as we can before he moves on. Well, at least the comic is aware enough about how tiring puns can be that it got all of them out of the way up front. Sonic weaves through the trees, trying to find Sally, unable to pinpoint her location other than the fact that she sounds like she's up a tree. Just as he's about to be grabbed by another one of the weird tree traps, the needle bird, which Sonic refers to lovingly as Thorny, flies in and scoops him up, saving him from being captured. I guess his wing wasn't that injured then. Great continuity, guys. With his new bird's eye view, Sonic is very easily able to discern where Sally's cries for help are coming from. One quick dive-bombing spin later, and Sally is free! Sort of. She's still stuck in the Beast's fist, and to make matters worse, Robotnik has appeared again, how the hell did he get there so fast, and has brought his Freeze Blaster with him, intent on finishing Sonic off himself. Sonic, however, can't do much dodging at the moment, as he's busy trying to free Sally from the tree monster's grip. Just as it seems like Robotnik's about to blast them both, an egg is dropped on his head. And while he's busy trying to wipe the yolk from his face, Thorny gets right up behind him and launches a barrage of needles at his backside. Robotnik dashes off and we end our comic with Sally and Sonic making Thorny an honorary freedom fighter, who will never be seen in this comic again. Seriously. This issue is bad. There's no getting around it, it's just bad. Neither story is that interesting or memorable, and they're both pretty stupid. 
The first story takes elements from one of the more forgettable episodes of the adventure series and actively uses those elements to make the story worse, such as the fact that Sonic isn't aware that he's picking poisonous flowers, the fact that Pseudo-Sonic is an ineffectual villain, the fact that the one smart moment, where the Freedom Fighters recognize that Pseudo isn't really Sonic, was undone by nobody trying to stop the obvious threat sitting there in the middle of their base, and the fact that Sonic's absence for most of the story was an extreme contrived coincidence that Robotnik had absolutely no idea was happening when he released Pseudo-Sonic. And it all adds up to a very boring, annoying mess of a story. The second story is better, but not by much, and once again, it comes down to Sally's behavior. I can understand her being pragmatic about the unknown animal, given past experiences were shown, but given how obvious those traps were, I'd like to think Sally could recognize a harmless creature when she sees it. Add to it her condemning it to the outside world, and potentially being killed or roboticized over a ruined birthday cake is just petty. And she once again makes the same mistake. She leaves Knothole without some sort of escort to defend her, thinking all will be well, and once again she ends up being captured for her troubles, and it's entirely her own damn fault. It's frustrating above all else, and I really wish I had more good things to say about it, but this issue is something that's real safe to skip. Not the worst, definitely, but a far cry from the quality we've been seeing the last few issues. Oh well, can't win them all, I suppose. Just grin and bear it and move on. Next time, it's issue 10, and we're moving on to the double digits of the comic, folks. Let's see what the next issue has in store for us, and let's hope it's something that stands above this one. 